Okay. Hello, my name is Sarah Bratnover. As Communications Director at Mississippi Valley Conservancy, I'm here to welcome you to learn more about the wolves of Wisconsin's Central Forest and to introduce you to today's speaker and to a colleague who joins me online today. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the Conservancy, we're interested to learn more about wolves because Wisconsin's Central Forest is in parts of two of the counties we serve. Uh, and judging by the response to today's presentation, we can see many others are also interested in this topic. So to allow for an uninterrupted presentation, we are, we've muted everyone on Zoom and uh, we invite you to enter any questions you have in the chat window at any time and we'll do our best to answer them after Dick's presentation. There's a button for the chat window at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And so you can type questions into there. I am joined for this Zoom event by Kristen Strong. You wanna wave Kristen? <laughs> uh, she is a member of our land protection team here at the Conservancy. She's our stewardship coordinator and she works to ensure that the lands we protect remain healthy for wildlife habitat and sustainable farming. And she'll be able to answer questions you may have about the Conservancy and the lands we protect. Now I wanna share a little about our guest speaker, Dick Thiel. Dick, can you wave? Oh, he's there, but there he is. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Dick Thiel was raised in Southeastern Wisconsin and became interested in the plight of wolves in his home state at the age of 13. In high school and throughout his college years, he searched for evidence of the return of wolves to Wisconsin. Graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources Management and Biology from UW Stevens Point in 1975, he worked briefly as an environmental educator. And in 1977, he obtained a temporary biologist position with the Wisconsin DNR at their Sand Hill Wildlife Area Deer Research Facility. While there, he privately continued searches for wolves, discovering and documenting their return and the eventual formation of breeding packs. In 1980, he was hired as the state's first wolf biologist, creating and managing Wisconsin's wolf recovery program from 1980 to 1990. He returned to Sand Hill as coordinator of an outdoor skills education center and retired in 2011 after 33 years of service. We thank him for joining us today. Dick, tell us what you can about the wolves of Wisconsin's Central Forest. All right, we're going to just see if we can share screen and go to the talk. So, can everybody hear me, I hope? So. Everybody's okay? I think so. Looks right. good. I can see your screen, Dick. All right. So um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk to you today. Um, while I was at Sand Hill Wildlife Area uh, between 1990 and 2011, wolves um, began colonizing what we call the Central Forest. And um, since I had had previous experience working with wolves in northern Wisconsin, um, I became kind of the um, administrative monitoring guru for the DNR for what, what was then called the West Central Region. And uh, my um, administrative charges were what a lot of times in DNR is, uh, you know, basically the chief bottle washer and, uh, and, uh, and other things. So I did a lot of this work from the ground up and also administered. Uh, and I reported to Adrian Y. Devon, who was the wolf biologist um, up in uh, northern Wisconsin. He had uh, administrative duties uh, statewide. So that, in a nutshell, is is um, what you know what my involvement has been. I've published a lot of uh, scientific papers on wolves, a lot of popular stuff on them. I have three books out on wolves um, in Wisconsin. Um, and, uh, and so done, done a lot of stuff with regards to these creatures. What I'd like to do today is, is just what I usually do to start out with any kind of talk is to 
to discuss some of the biological basis of what wolves are. So we're going to look at just kind of a broad brush of their natural history. Um, then I'm going to describe what is the central forest because it's more or less a, an administrative region that the DNR has long recognized as, as having some unique features. Um, and then we're going to talk about the wolf monitoring that I was responsible for in terms of what we learned during that time period. And then I want to conclude the talk by, by basically sharing with you um, the fact that wolves um, interact with humans and not all those interactions are, are good. And as a consequence, they need to be managed. And so we're going to discuss the three areas um, that uh, wolves can conflict with, with human beings. And, uh, and so we're going to get going. And uh, as Sarah said, at the end, we'll, we'll uh, uh, entertain questions. So. so just to give you a real brief um, description of management in Wisconsin, we have a long history of wolf management in Wisconsin. And it started back um, in the 1830s and 1840s prior to statehood with uh, territorial bounties. The state instituted its uh, what basically was um, a bounty that existed from 1865 to 1957. And so while it was, um, um, its, its emphasis was to exterminate wolves, that in its extreme really is wolf management. In this case, you know, the state uh, decided that these were vermin and that they needed to be gotten rid of. And so uh, we had a bounty that existed until 1957. The population by about 1920 was probably less than about uh, 250 animals. And it uh, certainly um, diminished over time. And by about the time the bounty was eliminated by our state legislature, there really were no breeding packs left in the state. And the only place where wolves were found at that time uh, in the continental United States is our neighboring state of Minnesota and uh, Isle Royal National Park uh, in the northern portion of Lake Superior. Um, so for about a 15 year period, they were considered extirpated, meaning there were none found in the state. They were extinct locally, if you will. And uh, by the early to mid 1970s, um, we started seeing evidence of, of their return. And that return was rather slow at first and then gradually picked up. Um, and, uh, and so that was what we, we refer to as the endangered and recolonizing portion of their recovery. Uh, by about the mid, um, uh, the first decade of the, this present century, by about 2005 to 2010, populations had, had uh, reached a level where um, once they were delisted federally, uh, the state uh, engaged in some legal hunts. Federal government was sued uh, nationwide, not just because of Wisconsin. They were placed back on the endangered species list and only this past uh, uh, December 31st where they've taken off the list once again. And yesterday, in fact, Natural Resources Board was petitioned by our legislature to institute a hunt immediately. Um, and uh, on a vote of four to three, they decided to wait until next autumn. Um, so you will probably be seeing um, a wolf uh, harvest season uh, again soon. So we're going to get into some of the basics uh, of what uh, the natural history of wolves are. Um, a wolf pack is nothing more than a family. And we have various definitions because, of course, we're humans. We like to be very specific about things. So administratively, in terms of the wildlife world, um, the definition in most of the management plans uh, for wolves in the upper Great Lakes region is, is basically just two or more wolves. Um, it makes no uh, suggestion as to whether it's a male and a female as part of the pair. It just says two or more wolves. And in reality, biologically, um, a wolf pack is, is a mated pair and their surviving offspring. Um, they mate once a year and we are fast approaching um, the peak in breeding, which is technically about the middle of February. Um, and about 63 days later, a litter of about five or six pups on average are born. And, uh, and so those animals um, are then, you know, another two or three months, they'll be part of this, this reproductive pack. And the pups from last year, which we still call pups today, uh, uh, will be one year old. And those animals then become what we call yearlings. And yearlings are sub-adult, they're not sexually mature, and they stay with mom and dad 
uh, until about um, uh, 18 to 20 months in which most of them actually do what we we call dispersing. And I'll talk more about that later. So before I get off this slide, I want you to realize that a wolf pack consists of a breeding pair, a, a male and a female. The offspring that survive uh, that are less than a year old, which we call pups, and the offspring that survive that are between one and two years of age, which we call yearlings. And at the end of that second year, again, just to reiterate, uh, most of those yearlings are going to disperse. They're going to leave the pack in search of a space and a, and a mate. The prey in Wisconsin for white-tailed deer is fairly simple. Um, wherever wolves occur, they are what we call ungulate predators. So they are eating, they're trying to hunt and, and eat animals that have hooves at the end of their legs. So uh, the only option in Wisconsin, of course, is white-tailed deer, although we have some elk in the state. And every once in a while we get moose, but not down in this region, the central forest uh, with moose. We do have some elk in uh, eastern Jackson County. Uh, but in any event, uh, the primary diet is, is white-tailed deer. They supplement this with beaver. And, uh, and then they have occasional snack foods, which we call snowshoe hares and some of the other things that are out there. Uh, their diet is more focused on white-tailed deer during the winter than in any other time of the year primarily because beaver are not available in a normal winter. For instance, this winter, because there's no ice on any of our ditches or our rivers, uh, beavers are probably still accessible. Uh, but if we have a normal winter, um, they're basically locked safe and secure inside their lodges and they just have to swim to their food caches and grab a nibble and go back into their lodge and, and uh, finish business. So they're inaccessible. Um, all of these species of prey for wolves rely on um, early stage forests, primarily dominated by aspen. Aspen is the fuel for all three of these species. And so if you're going to manage a landscape for wolves, you're actually managing it indirectly because you're managing it for a young cereal stage or an early growth stage uh, that most benefits white-tailed deer, beaver, and snowshoe hare. Um, and so wolf management if you were managing for wolves is really managing for uh, species such as uh, aspen and oak that are sun loving uh, and fast, uh, fast growing. Now we've already described a little bit about the reproductive patterns. Um, the pups are born in April and uh, they're too small to travel with their parents and their older sibs through the territories that these individual packs occupy. Uh, their legs are just not big enough. And so they are sequestered in what we call rendezvous sites or home sites. Um, and as soon as they leave the den, which is usually middle of May, uh, end of May, they are no longer going to be sheltered by anything. They're just going to be plopped down perhaps in a grassy meadow that's a former uh, uh, beaver pond. Um, and usually these rendezvous, we call them rendezvous sites, they are associated with water of which there really is no shortage in Wisconsin. There's a lot of surface water laying around, so the wolves don't have to look too much for, for that uh, particular uh, 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 attribute. But in any event, uh, they occupy these rendezvous sites until uh, late August, September, sometimes into October. Um, and so the adults and the yearlings will come and go like spokes on a wheel from the rendezvous site because they have to go out and hunt uh, they also, the breeders also have to patrol their territory against intrusions from uh, foreign wolves. And so very busy, um, very stressful time of life because um, chronically, um, uh, physiologically, the adults are, are probably undernourished because they're having to feed these voracious little appetites that they've got. By September-ish, the pup's legs are big enough and they're growing fairly decently that they, the pack gradually abandons the rendezvous site and they start moving around more or less in unison throughout the territory. And so we see these movement patterns change or shift from summer to winter. And so typically a wolf will, uh, a wolf pack will, um, and, and I hate saying the word meander because that implies, you know, no volition on their part, but they're, they're, they definitely know their territory they know where the, the food is. They know where the boundaries are. They're moving with purpose. 
And uh, so they will be coursing through their territories in search of prey. Um, and what I wanted to do is just explain to you a, a strategy that, that um, predators, mammalian predators use. There's two basic predatory strategies. One is called coursing and the other one is called ambush. The cat family are evolved to be ambush predators as an example for an ambush uh, type of prey, uh, pred predation rather. Wolves are coursers. That means that they're actively out searching uh, on a daily basis and they are looking for the prey. They're not waiting for prey to come to them. They're looking for prey. Now, one of the problems that wolves have is because they're relatively small compared to their prey, um, a typical wolf in Wisconsin, uh, an adult male who's at, you know, older than two years old will weigh somewhere around 60 to 90 pounds and a female is going to be about 20% lighter. Um, with the exception of fawns, white-tailed deer weigh more than wolves. And throughout North America, wolves focus on animals uh, that, that are ungulates. And so the smallest that they typically take are white-tailed deer and the largest that they take are bison, musk oxen, and moose, which typically go over a thousand pounds. So there's a, there's a tenfold difference um, in the uh, upper areas of the ungulate prey available to wolves. Um, Consequently, wolves are, when they're out coursing and looking for prey, they're testing them to basically determine inside their brains whether there's too much risk involved to try and pull this thing down to make it for dinner um, and hope that, you know, they'll bump into something that's, that's more vulnerable uh, around the bend. Um, and so they have to make these decisions based on, on uh, what the risk factors are. And so... Uh, for instance, with moose on Isle Royal, studies have shown that about 10% of the moose that they bump into are, are ones that they actually actively pursue um, and, and take down. Um, and so um, these decisions are made on a daily basis by wolves as they're hunting. And when they make a kill, um, they will stay near the kill until the kill is pretty much totally consumed. Um, and uh, uh, they may walk off a mile or two it's kind of like you and I eating a big turkey dinner on Thanksgiving and going into the other room and laying down on the couch and then coming back, you know, at the end of the day and, and opening up the refrigerator and, and getting a turkey leg to chew on. Uh, and you may do that for days afterwards for Thanksgiving. This is what wolves do. Uh, so those are some of the movement patterns. Uh, this is an area where wolves get into trouble with humans. Wolves are exceedingly territorial. The definition of territory is a space that's defended against others of your own kind. A white-tailed deer, for instance, has a home range and a wolf has a territory. And the distinction is they both occupy a, a defined space uh, and that space has boundaries, but a deer does not defend its space against others of its own kind. Uh, so you can literally stockpile deer, you can increase deer densities, all you've got to do is increase the food capacity. Um, uh, with regards to wolves, though, um, they are uh, territorial and they will defend their space against others of their own kind, specifically the genus Canis. Wolves are Canis lupus, coyotes are Canis latrans, and dogs are either Canis lupus familiaris or Canis familiaris, depending upon which scientist you talk to. Um, and so uh, if a coyote is found and encountered inside a wolf pack territory, they will give chase. And if they catch it, they will kill it. And as you see in this photo in the lower left corner, that is a freshly killed coyote that was killed on Fort McCoy uh, in recent years. Um, and this animal just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, encountered by a pack of wolves and it was uh, dispatched rather quickly. Um, when wolves kill because of territoriality, they very, very rarely eat or consume uh, what they kill. What they're, the purpose of killing is to get rid of it inside their space. And they're not terribly interested in eating it, not that they can't do it. Uh, it's just that they've just gotten rid of uh, a potential intruder. And so the problem, of course, is dogs. Um, and this is something that is hardwired in wolves, and it's just something that's part of them, and there's nothing you can do to change that behavior. 
So that's, in a nutshell, the natural history of wolves. Now we're going to get into the central forest, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the monitoring that goes on, or had gone on, actually. So I've got a map on the left side showing the central forest region. It's about uh, three, I think it's 3,000 square miles. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an isolated chunk uh, in west central Wisconsin that has uh, the attribute on the right hand side, if you can see that map, of having a large percent of its uh, land mass in some type of public uh, domain. A lot of it is county forest land. A fairly good chunk of it is either state forest or state wildlife areas. There's federal lands, both Fort McCoy and the Nacida National Wildlife Refuge and the, uh, the Babcock Bombing Range. And then there are county forest lands as well. Um, and about 35% of central forest is publicly owned. Now, publicly owned land is an attribute of wolf uh, habitat um, because wolves live in a matrix that's dominated by human beings. Uh, one of the things that wolves gravitate to as they're dispersing is isolated tracks away from human beings. And of course, public lands um, satisfy that. And so this is an attractant to wolves, not that they have a roadmap saying, oh, let's go to the central forest because there's public land down there. It's just that when they're dispersing, as they encounter these kinds of things, um, that, that is a cue to them that this might be suitable habitat to settle into. Uh, so in any event, this is the central forest. And uh, it's, it tends to be not exclusively, but a lot of it um, is uh, a part of uh, ancient glacial Lake Wisconsin. So it's all sand flats and, and very flat, very swampy and uh, um, also filled with uh, either aspen or oak or, or jack pine forests, all of which are these uh, young cereal stage forests. So the wolves got down in here uh, in the early 1990s. The first time that uh, we found wolf sign was in 1994, in the fall of 94. And uh, at about the same time, we had two radioed wolves from Minnesota, one from Minnesota, one from Northern Wisconsin that actually um, were killed, um, both of them by cars, um, in uh, and around the Central Forest. So that was another kind of a clue that um, wolves might be arriving in the Central Forest and might be able to, to colonize this place. And so uh, one of the first winter track surveys that I participated in, in coordination with um, some other wildlife people, we were actually able to find 12 wolves in the Central Forest. Um, and we already had a pack of, of wolves breeding and we had four pairs most likely um, that were going to breed that winter. Uh, and then we also found a single wolf. Um, and so they colonized this area uh, in the early 90s. And uh, so we're going to follow that colonization. So I want you to, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's a polygon that's kind of peach colored here and a green color and a gray color here that we've overlain on the public lands. The first packs uh, that I referred to in the other slide um, literally found these areas with, with high densities, almost 100% uh, public land attributes, and uh, colonized that and began reproducing. And, uh, and so this, is, this was the start of uh, colonization of wolves in the Central Forest, and these were the places. So the Black River State Forest uh, was one of them. Uh, some of the Jackson County forest land and also uh, portions of Meadow Valley State Wildlife Area, which is incidentally the largest wildlife area in the state of Wisconsin with approximately 100,000 acres of wildlife area. So um, I was in charge of uh, the regional monitoring work of wolves that got off the ground in 1995 and I retired in 2011. And at that time, the Scott Walker administration came in um, and uh, wolf management emphases started changing pretty rapidly after that. Um, but in any event, from 95 to 2011, when I was responsible for this, um, we instituted the same field techniques that I had developed in northern Wisconsin in the 1980s and that Adrian Wydevin had, had taken over and expanded upon. So um, in order to essentially figure out what, what wolves were doing in the central forest, and monitoring these animals, we um, instituted winter ground tracking surveys, summer howl surveys to figure out how many of these packs actually were producing pups. 
uh, radio telemetry. So we would go out and try and catch wolves, put radios on them and learn a lot more about them. And then also necropsies, which is the same thing as a human autopsy. These, all of these animals that we would find dead, no matter where they were, if they were on a roadside or if they were, you know, deep forest, um, we would take them, the bodies out of the woods and we would send them down to the National Wildlife Health Lab in Madison for a necropsy. All of those animals, incidentally, that um, after they were processed in that uh, mechanism, um, the entire salvageable remains of that animal um, were put up at the UW Zoology Museum. And incidentally, the Uni University of Wisconsin Zoology Museum has the largest collection of entire wolf skeletons now, probably in the world. Um, they've got over, I think, 150 skeletons from Wisconsin uh, in the last 25, 30 years. So pretty substantial scientific collection there. Well, what all these things do is they provide us information on how many wolves are there? Um, and our census work is done December to March, and those are the winter tracking surveys and telemetry work. What's the productivity? Summer health surveys will tell us, you know, pretty much how many pups are being born out there and in which territories. What's the territory size of these individual packs? Um, what's the survivorship like? You know, how long does a wolf live? And does it, you know, how many of these animals actually contribute genes to the succeeding generation? And then we also learn causes of death. So all of those field techniques provide us with this kind of collage of information, which is really important um, in trying to determine, you know, populations of wolves and what they're doing and where they're going. So we're going to explain a little bit about this. Um, in Wisconsin, throughout the entire state, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a map uh, with blocks. Um, there's about 150 or so blocks, um, and in each block, uh, there are volunteers and agency staff that are assigned to go out at least three times following snowfall during the winter months and try to locate packs. When they locate the pack, um, they try to figure out how many individuals are in the pack. And in some of these blocks, there may be three or four different packs because, again, keep in mind they're territorial, so they occupy unique space that does not overlap. Um, and this is how they basically run these uh, surveys throughout the winter months. And that gives us a really good impression at that time um, of how many wolves um, were living in the state and geographically, where were they? And incidentally, um, before I move off this slide, the, the Wisconsin DNR now is, is shifting away from this type of approach of assessing wolf population size, which was a census. Uh, and they're moving towards what's called a patch occupancy model, which is more of an estimate. Um, and so there, you're, you're going to be seeing a transition in the next few years into the, this uh, pack, patch occupancy model, which is the acronym is POM, P-O-M. Uh, but in any event, this is this this census work has been the um, the backbone of wolf uh, counting in Wisconsin for 40 years. Now, just to give you an impression of how this works, this is a map of the Nacida National Wildlife Refuge, and this shows the um, an encounter I had with wolves on the 8th of March in 2018. And I started out just to the west of Nacida on Highway 21, and I drove up to the headquarters went west from headquarters just below the Reinerson pool. And you'll see this red squiggly line. I encountered the wolf pack um, and they were walking in my direction. So I'm essentially, as I'm going west, they're going east, I'm following their back trail. Um, and so I keep going, I'm in a vehicle and uh, they leave and they are heading, uh, they came onto the road from the direction of Reinerson. So I just keep on going all of a sudden I bump into them up to the Northwest and I follow them off and on a series of roads. Uh, and from the top point where they were up to the northwest down to the south, that's a 10 mile stretch of road. Um, and so these wolves had walked a minimum of 10 miles overnight. And this is nothing for a wolf pack. Um, there's a Russian fable that says the wolf was kept fed by its feet. And because these are coursing animals, they're moving constantly. And to walk 10 miles, they can do that in two hours. Um, so that's absolutely nothing for these guys. The limitation is me because I can't get to all corners in a 24 hour period of what they've walked. And the fortunate thing in Wisconsin is this technique works so beautifully because we have a fairly high density of rural or forested roads in the areas occupied by wolves. 
Radio telemetry is pretty much the backbone. Um, and uh, in Central Forest, we put in over uh, 3,000 trap nights of work over that period of time. We caught 55 wolves over that period. Uh, and we also caught pups. Um, we couldn't put radios on a lot of those little guys because their neck is still growing. And, uh, and uh, if you put a collar on them, um, it can choke them. Uh, we didn't have expandable collars because we learned from elsewhere that, um, you know, other studies by wolves elsewhere, that expandable collars are a perfect thing for fellow pups to chew off their necks. And so you'd put a radio on a pup and three days later, the radio is off with all kinds of nice little teeth marks in it. Um, and so we were pretty much in the habit of ear tagging the, the pups in the hopes, you know, basically hoping that maybe when they're a yearling or an adult, we would re-encounter it and be able to radio it and trace it back to its natal pack. We averaged about 50 trap nights per wolf caught. And normally um, we would be running a trap line of maybe 10. Um, traps uh, on a route and uh, and so it would take five days to catch a wolf. Um, checking them every 24 hours, uh, rain or, or uh, thunderstorms or sunny weather. The only time we would not trap was when we had high humidities and, and temperatures predicted for over 85 degrees. Um, because wolves when they are sedated, um, they are a member of the dog family and um, to cool they pant. Panting is a voluntary musculatory reflex. Breathing is not, that's autonomic. So they're still breathing, but they can't get rid of excess heat. And so at over 85 degrees Fahrenheit, when they're sedated, they're laying there and they're stressed um, and they're just building up internal body heat because of the stress and, and uh, because they can't pant. And so we took precautions um, to keep them as cool as possible. One of the extremes was at 85 degrees or higher, we would literally pull traps. Well, that's a job guys, because when you put a wolf trap in the ground, it's gotta be totally concealed. Um, there's an attractant that you put there, which is usually something really smelly. Um, to minimize, or I should say to maximize that the wolf's chance of walking there, you've gotta um, minimize your own smells. And so things like bug dope um, are a no-no. Um, and I don't mind not ever trapping a wolf again because I've had enough of my blood, uh, probably more gallons of, of blood sucked out of me by mosquitoes and deer flies than any of you would standing in a Red Cross line for blood donations. So um, when you're doing this kind of work and you can't use bug dope, it's, it's somewhat challenging. Uh, but in any event, we radioed um, 26 females, 27 males. And then listening to all of those beeping radios, we had almost 17,000 radio days of data. Now I'm just showing this to you to let you know that this is science at work. And there's a lot of science that we got out of this stuff. And it was year after year after year after year. And this is really cool stuff. Now a backdrop on our census. There's a lot of challenges to the way that we count wolves um, and our detractors, people that hate wolves or do not like wolves or do not like DNR, they're all, they're constantly bickering, of course, about, we don't know how to count anything. For instance, we, we overcount deer and we drastically undercount wolves. Um, so I guess we're just not good at counting, but here's the deal is that we, we pick animals, um, when they're most vulnerable to being counted. Um, so a ruffed grouse down in, in, in where you guys work, um, they're, they're, they're definitely declining. Um, but we used to run um, uh, road surveys and listen for drumming males in the spring of the year in April. We'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and drive these routes. We'd stop at one-mile intervals, and we'd listen to males drumming. And uh, we would count how many animals were drumming in a 10-mile circuit. Um, and year after year after year after year, doing it at the same time of, of year, you can see patterns of ups and downs in a, in a grouse population. So I'm using it as an example. We, we count animals when they're most uh, conducive to being counted. And with wolves, because uh, they leave tracks in the snow, they're conducive to being counted. And so we always count our wolves um, in winter. Now, we also understand that that is at the nadir or the bottom of the annual cycle of wolves, because just after we complete our count, all of the pups are being born. 
And that population is going to go up at least twofold. But by the time you get back to the next winter, a lot of those animals have died um, or they have moved on or whatever. And, uh, and so the population is, is back down to its low point in the annual cycle. So this just shows you from the mid-1990s in Wisconsin, uh, a count of 549 wolves one winter, the next winter 637. So we are able to track the, the ups and downs in the wolves primarily because we're counting them at the same time of year. And, uh, and as our population went up, we, it went up because we're consistent when we count these. So that's how we do it. So this is the central forest population um, and how it changed over time. The blue line shows the number of packs and the red line is the total number of animals. Uh, and I've only graphed this out to, to the winter of 1617, which is like three or four years ago. But in any event, um, it hasn't changed substantially since then. Um, we are averaging somewhere around 100 to 120 wolves in the central forest. They've essentially plateaued out and uh, there's just no more room for wolves. And so as a consequence, all these spaces are filled up. You know, the territories are, you know, they're, they're filled with territories. And so um, there's just, the counts are going to be probably bouncing between 100 and 120. Right now, in fact, with the track surveys that myself and a bunch of timber timber wolf information network um, uh, collaborators uh, are, are doing right now in the central forest. I think I'm up to a count right now of 85 wolves and we've got about 18 packs to go. But most of those packs are in what we call marginal areas. So some of them probably don't even exist anymore. So we'll see what we've got. Uh, but in any event, um, you know, we, we expect or anticipate that's pretty much what central forest is going to have. Now, this is an interesting thing. This has been shown in other regions of the, of the world where wolves have colonized. Essentially what we mean by colonization is they were wiped out of these areas. And then they came back in. Now they may have come back in because they're just walking on their own four paws into this region as they did in Central Forest, or it could be something like Yellowstone National Park where wolves were translocated. But in any event, what we see uh, with colonization as a population establishes itself, it moves from what we call colonization to saturation. And I think you can understand the difference between those two words, but watch what happens to territory size um, as we move from colonization to uh, saturation. And these are, these, this is data right out of radio telemetry in the central forest. So uh, 10 years or later or five years later, we start seeing a, a diminishment in the size of the territories. And by the time we reach saturation, it's half of what it was. <coughs> Excuse me. And so real estate is exceedingly important um, to wolves because they're territorial. So when they come into a place, they can take as much space as they want because there's no, nothing to buffer them in. But as that population starts to expand, these spots are starting to get you know, nucleated. And as each of these things expand, it causes the original territories they have to shrink down a tad. And incidentally, a lot of those neighboring packs inside, inside what we call a, a, a colonizing pack on the edge of a colonizing pack are what we call butt outs. And that literally means um, an offspring from that founding pack just usurps a corner or an edge of the territory because it's found a mate drifting through and they establish a territory right on the edge. And so it becomes what we call a butt out. And, uh, and as a consequence, as time goes on, they do this and they expand and contract and, and then they're essentially usurping or stealing a part of mom and dad's territory. Um, and so uh, by the time you get to saturation, um, all of this has been juggled around and um, things remain fairly static after that point relatively. In terms of pack productivity, going out and doing summer howl surveys, which is a lot of fun, but also full of mosquitoes, um, we go out in the evenings uh, right at dusk and uh, we try to find the rendezvous sites. And sometimes we have the added advantage of a um, radio location saying that it's probably a, a dense or a, a home site in this area. And so we would go out to those areas and, and howl in the hopes that we would elicit a response. Uh, wolf pups sound different than adults. They have a high yip yappy sound, not unlike coyotes, but wolves have a, a straight dragged out howl. And, uh, and so 
you'll hear the adults and the yearlings howling and you'll know those are adults and yearlings. And then you have this high yip gappy stuff and uh, that signals to us that howl, um, that, that those are pups. And so we know that, you know, that that pack has had pups. And so um, the, here's another really cool thing about science, you guys. You can't work with a negative in this business. So if I go out to the Mather East pack and I howl to them and I don't get a response, that doesn't mean they didn't have pumps, pups. What that means is we didn't get a response. So the data that you see here averaging 72% over the years means that was our response rate, meaning at least those packs, out of, out of all the packs in the central forest, 72% of them had pups. And what I suspect, which you can't report in science, of course, is that probably we're pushing 90% of the packs are having pups each year because they're very prolific. And, uh, uh, and so this is just the data we have to work with because we can't deal with the negative on there, which is, to me, it's kind of neat. But a lot of people don't understand science, so they don't understand that. They look at 72 as being, oh, that's all they had. No, we know minimally that this is how many packs are producing pups, but we suspect it's much higher. Now we're going to talk about those dispersers. Dispersers um, are usually yearlings, sometimes pups, sometimes two to three year olds, maybe even a four year old that, that lingers with mom and dad, but they leave um, the, the, their natal territory in search of space and, and uh, a, a, a potential mate. And uh, some of them, as I said, go right next door, they butt out. Uh, and some of them go great distances. So we call those guys uh, long distance dispersers. And one of my uh, colleagues in, in uh, in Poland, uh, Sabina Nowak calls them jump dispersers, which I really love because they really can jump. That arrow that you see is the, the Wisconsin record so far for dispersal. Uh, it was a male wolf pup that was uh, radioed in the Black River State Forest um, in, I think it was 2002 or three. And uh, it was still at the natal, uh, in the natal pack in early January. And then six months later, it was found shot to death in a cornfield 15 miles to the west of the Ohio border in the state of Indiana. It had moved over 280 miles, and it had done that within six months, and it did it mostly as a pup. And um, imagine the rivers, the freeways, and even the urban settings that this animal had to traverse and negotiate to get to where it got. Um, and uh, the ultimate fate, of course, of these animals, unfortunately, if they go south is what happened to this pup and they got shot. Um, but in any event, uh, we've had animals that go north. We've had them go back into Minnesota. We've had them go into the Upper Peninsula. We've had wolves from the UP and Minnesota come down to Central Forest. And this is all brought to you on behalf of radio telemetry, which is kind of cool. But if you look at the breakdown, um, in terms of you know, how prolific these animals are and how colonization works, um, some of these animals, you know, four of these animals for each sex were able to establish a new territory. So they, they stayed alive long enough to develop a new pack. Um, some of them actually integrated into existing packs. Um, and a bunch of them we suspected actually reproduced. Well, so in some cases we know they reproduced, so they were successful. And about half of them stayed in the central forest and half of them jumped us first. So this is the world of wolves, guys. This is some really cool stuff, but this is what wolves do. So when I get questions about, geez, you know, I'm, I live in Greene County and I, uh, are there wolves here? My answer is probably not breeders, but you're gonna get dispersers because they're dispersing everywhere. They have no roadmap and a compass to say, what is the safest place to go find suitable habitat? They just leave. And, uh, and so this is just part of it. And keep in mind, even Darwin pointed it out that uh, you know life is considered is is awfully wasteful. So there's a lot of a lot of young animals that don't make it to adulthood because it's just fate. Um, but in any event, this is how it all works out, and it's pretty neat stuff. Now, age in the central forest, um, and this stuff I've never published, and the reason for it is sample size is way too small. Um, but I keep getting questions when I do talks like this of what is the average age of wolves. And I, a lot of times, because you know I'm a scientist, I really don't understand really specifically what you're asking. Um, 
are you asking, you know, like how old could a wolf conceivably get, like, you know, Guinness World Book of Records? With me as a wildlife biologist, I'm more, more interested in what is the age at death and how does that compare to reproductive years of a population? Because if, it, if the average age at death is before you can reproduce, your population is going to probably have some problems. Um, and here's the deal, and these are all statistics, so it's not like every wolf does this. This is, this is a collection of a whole mess of wolves that I, you know, I knew the fate of. And um, the oldest of those animals lived to be eight years old. The average age at death of all these animals, and there was something like 30 animals involved, was 2.2 uh, years. Reproductive life starts at a little less than two years, at, at about uh, 20, 22 months of age. That is, the plumbing's intact. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to reproduce your first year. But in any event, if you look at that red part of the chart, um, you'll see that you know half of that population is already gone by the time they could reproduce. And of those that make it to reproductive years, typically most of those animals are going to be contributing genes for a mere one, two, three, maybe four years of life, and they're done. Now this falls back on the thing I, I told you before of risk management. You walk up to a deer, are you going to get kicked in the face and lose some teeth? Um, or are you going to say, no, this guy's too feisty and I'm going to go on and hope that I can find a, a deer that's vulnerable someplace else? As a consequence of, of the testing, wolves get beat up. And uh, by the time they get to be six, eight years of age, um, they're feeling the wear of life. And so life doesn't really go on much longer than, than what you see here. Yes, we have records of, of wild wolves that have lived to be 14 years of age. We have records of white-tailed deer in Wisconsin that have lived to be 18 years of age. But the average age at death of a white-tailed deer buck in Wisconsin is 1.75 years. And the average age of reproduction is 1.5 years. And so a lot of these animal populations are teetering right on that edge between what is the average age at death and reproductive you know, capacity. And so that's just the way it is. Life is, is squeezed. And uh, for us wildlife biologists, that's pretty much what we see and we're accustomed to it, but some of these statistics would be kind of shocking. Now, survivorship. Amongst adult wolves, you know, the ones that are wearing radios, about 73% uh, annual survival. Now, what I want to impress upon you guys is that means that one out of every four wolves that is alive today will be dead a year from now. That's 75% survival rate, but it's a 25% death rate. With regards to a study that we did on pups in Wisconsin during a mange episode, only 20% of the pups made it uh, beyond their ninth month of life. Um, and we don't really put much emphasis on immature lifespans um, because from year to year, it can be highly variable. This was the low point. But we've had pups survival up to 70%. Um, and so with regards to immature animals, it doesn't matter if you're talking about robins or wolves or deer, mortality is all over the board uh, in any individual year. And so if you smooth it out over time, um, probably with regards to pups, we're looking at probably about 40% survival to their first year of life. Uh, and then of course they're in the adult phase and they've got a 25% chance of dying each year that they live until death catches up with them. Now, the cause of death in the central forest is primarily uh, human uh, illegal and human accidental. Um, and this, of course, during that time period, um, this was when they were federally endangered. So any kind of killing of wolves um, is considered illegal if it's not, we, we only separate out accidental meaning uh, car kills. Uh, so natural forms of, of death were fairly low. And uh, we also included a couple of cases uh, in 2012 to 14 of uh, radioed wolves that were harvested during the, the harvest that we had in uh, 2012, 13, and 14. Um, so the lion's share, depend, you know, if you, the takeaway from this slide is that most wolves in Wisconsin, and, and, and especially in Central Forest, um, human beings are the primary cause of death. If they're going to die, it's pretty much given that they're going to die because of people some, in some capacity. Now, with regards to wolf management, there's three areas that we delve into. Um, depredations, because they will kill cattle, uh, sheep. 
Uh, competition for big game. Hunters don't like wolves, not all hunters, but some hunters uh, feel the competition is inordinate and they don't want wolves around. Um, and then also the area of, of uh, uh, human safety. Wolves are carnivores and um, they, just because they've ne never shown a predilection for, for taking humans, despite the Little Red Riding Hood stories, um, does not mean that they're incapable of it. And so as a manager, you have to be very, very careful when there are close encounters with wolves and humans that are reported to you. So we're going to look at that just a tad bit. So in the central forest, um, uh, we've rarely had any cases of complaints during the time period when I was there. Um, and um, about 35% uh, of the complaints that we had were uh, uh, caused by wolves. The rest of them were were essentially other things. Uh, with regards to management options, um, when they're federally endangered, the only thing that we can do is compensation. We can compensate for the loss, the value of the loss. We can employ non-lethal techniques on the, on the farm uh, to try and scare the wolves off to, to minimize any chance reoccurrences. And then when they're not uh, federally endangered, um, they can be lethally removed. And we've had a couple of time periods in the central forest where um, we've been able to lethally remove wolves. Uh, and it's not been often and there haven't been a lot of them, but in any event, these are all management options. And I, as a wolf biologist, I agree with all of them. There are cases where, you know, I have actually signed papers for the lethal removal of wolves when I worked in that capacity because we'd basically reached the end of our rope, nothing else was working and let's take those wolves out. Um, now, with regards to humans and, and hunter, human hunters and the competition for white-tailed deer, it was a really good study done um, in, uh, by the University of Wisconsin back in the, uh, about 2009 to about 2012. Two different areas, uh, comparative studies, one up in winter Wisconsin, which is the northwest. You see that purple map of Wisconsin, the upper left, and then down to the south of Green Bay. Uh, the difference between the, the techniques were the same, but the difference was that the winter area, northwestern Wisconsin, had wolves and the one south of Green Bay did not. And specifically what they're trying to do is tease out what is the contribution of uh, deer mortality caused by wolves and specifically a, a female or doe deer uh, and then fawns. And what they did was they radioed does, they radioed fawns. They also radioed coyotes, bears, bobcats, and wolves. Uh, and what they found was that um, in both the east central and the northwestern part of the, the state, Human hunters, or human beings, I should say, were, were the number one cause of mortality of adult deer, uh, does, that is. Um, and if you look at that bottom line on the upper chart north, it says, if you add up all those human things in the red circle, and then you look to the far right, you'll see that uh, six wolves, 6% uh, percent of the deaths were caused by wolves. You'd probably reasonably have to conclude that, you know, wolves are part of that picture, but they're not positive. When you get down in the realm of fawns, this is something that's really interesting. You would think that wolves would be the number one because wolves are obligate predators of deer, and yet it was anything but wolves. Um, now, there is a reason for it, everybody, and the reason for it is you've got four wolves roaming around a 60 square mile territory, let's say 50 square mile territory. How many coyotes do you have in there? How many bear do you have in there? And how many bobcats? The densities of coyotes and the densities of bobcats and bears is much higher than wolves. And so there are lots of predatory mouths to feed out there. And so the reason why wolves don't even factor in, even though they're, they're taking fawns, no question, is that statistically there's a lot more of the other things out there than there are wolves. And, and so wolves are part of the picture, but in order to have a complete picture, if you're truly interested in what's causing death of, of deer and might take away from my enjoyment of a hunt, it's everything. It's not just wolves, it's everything collectively. And we wildlife managers have to know that as well so that we can effectively you know, produce quotas for white-tailed deer and even for wolves when we're having a harvest of wolves. Now in the realm of public safety, when I was there in the Central Forest, we averaged somewhere between two and four incidences of uh, what we call habituation every year um, in the Central Forest. The upper right-hand corner shows a picture. 
I think you could probably see there's two human beings on the left center of that thing. And you can also see on the right lower corner, that's a wolf pup. And between the guys and the wolf pup is a cranberry bog bed. We would have somewhere between two and four wolf packs that were raising their pups on those cranberry beds every year. So those workers that are mowing those dikes, spraying their herbicides, managing their water levels in their tubes and things, they're out there on a daily basis intensively managing these cranberry beds. And those wolf pups are laying there looking at them. And so they have no negative reinforcements and so they become habituated to the presence of people. And so they then disperse and they carry that as colonization proceeds. They carry it to a spot nearby where there's another cranberry bog. And they've already learned that, well, this is no big deal. I'll just have my pups right here. This is great. It's sunny. The mosquitoes aren't too bad in the middle of the day out here in the bed. Um, but the problem is, of course, they're getting contact with no negative reinforcement with people. And uh, I had one of these situations where I had to essentially sign lethal orders for removal of wolves because the wolves moved from what we call habituation behavior to bold behavior, where they would walk up to people and growl at them. That's a no-no. And when that proceeded for a couple of months, it was time to take out some wolves. And so we, in one case, uh, and I, you know, I, I was party to the signing of the, the, uh, the, the release for kill. Uh, we took out an entire pack of wolves. Um, and it was because of this behavior. So you have to realize that there's a reason why we manage wolves. We manage wolves for a whole mass of reasons, but one of them is we have to be very considerate of public safety. And in a place that's dominated, a landscape dominated by humans, um, you're just going to have these kinds of situations that crop up and you've got to be prepared to deal with it. Dick, this is Sarah. I'm just interrupting to let you know it's almost 11 and we have our Zoom time reserved until 1130. So I want to be sure you leave at least 15 minutes for discussion. Okay. And I am almost done. So thank you. So a couple of last things. Um, Teresa Simpson just completed a master's at the University of La Crosse using GIS and using 25 years worth of radio location data and other stuff from the DNR. And what we were interested in doing was figuring out um, what is the habitats that wolves occupy and where do wolves, what kinds of habitat do they get stressed to the point where they can no longer make it? And she was uh, able to look at some of these differences. And basically in the central forest, um, optimal habitat was defined as, as a high percent of public land, a very low percent of agricultural land and road densities at about, um, about one and a half uh, miles per square mile of habitat. Um, Mixed habitat was only met one of those three criterion and marginal habitat met none of those. And so uh, what she found was that there was no difference between the optimal and the mixed habitat. But what she did find was that marginal land, the wolves occupying those places had very small midwinter wolf pack sizes, very poor reproductive performance. And here's the real operative thing is that their human cause mortality rates were six times, six times higher than in the neighboring mixed and optimal habitat types. And so what she was able to do was basically define where's the edge beyond which they fall off as a population. And that marginal stuff is exactly where it is. Now that picture there is just another picture as I just described in the previous slide. Those are wolf pups and you can see the spigots and uh, whatnot on a cranberry bed. Um, and so, so these are all things that are very important. Um, now to, to just kind of uh, conclude, um, the wolves in the central forest, they colonize this space, this huge space, very rapidly. Um, they, they colonized the optimal habitats first, then spilled into the mix, and then ultimately the marginal habitats as, as real estate became occupied. Conflicts here are managed. Um, most evident are the, the marginal areas. That's where the lion's share of, or I should say the wolf share of uh, of conflicts actually occur in the central forest. And um, and the stuff that we've observed in terms of colonization of central forest has been seen in Northwestern Montana, other areas of the upper peninsula and West central Minnesota as well. And so we know now know that when wolves colonize places, 
there are patterns that are pretty obvious and you could almost predict, you know, how they're going to do what and, uh, and how, how well they're going to perform based on some of the things that we've been able to accomplish here in the Central Forest. So there are some uh, educational organizations. I know you've got questions, which is good. You can also visit uh, International Wolf Center. Um, their website is wolf.org. Um, and uh, I'm uh, on the board of directors for that organization, so I'll toot their horn. Um, I'm also a member of Timberwolf Information Network. Their, uh, their site is timberwolfinformation.org. And um, we do uh, winter wolf ecology, two-day winter wolf ecology workshops every winter, with the exception of this winter because of COVID. So we're hoping to be back in business again next year. We have three different venues in which we do that, and it includes a half day of uh, a, a full day worth of lectures, very detailed college 101 type stuff, but then a half day of uh, being out in the field looking at wolf track and wolf sign. Um, so I invite you to, to explore these sites. Um, they are not advocacy groups, meaning they don't have a, a, a horn to toot in terms of, well, we want wolves to be in Iowa or whatever. This is just educational stuff. This is science-based information. You want information, these places will be able to provide you with it. You take that information, make decisions based on whatever it is that toots your horn. Uh, recommended reading, in case any of you guys are interested in any of this stuff, um, a couple of non-technical ones, Keepers of the Wolves, um, which I uh, authored and uh, published by University of Wisconsin Press in 2018. So it's hot off the press, so to speak. Wild Wolves We Have Known uh, from the International Wolf Center. Um, and you, you can only get that at the International Wolf Center, but you just go into their shop and get it. And I edited that, so I'm biased, but it's a really good book, what the heck. Um, and then a technical one is The Recovery of Gray Wolves uh, by Springer. And uh, it basically covers, you know, what's been going on in the upper Great Lakes states since wolves were placed on the endangered species list in the 1970s. And um, just some of the collaborators, just to show you who helped out with uh, supplying either information or photos. And then last but not least, Sarah, I'll turn it back to you for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. And Kristen, I know you have been taking copious notes on the questions. Do you want to leave that for us? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so we have a number of questions from the chat. And then once we go through those, I think we can open it up for um, any questions if people want to take themselves off mute. Um, but I will start. Our first question comes from Kara. Uh, she was wondering whether or not you had a so you mentioned early on that Aspen and those early successional forests were important for, for wolf populations and was wondering if willow stands are included in the types of fast growing trees and landscapes that they're, they're drawn to. Yes, um, in my area here in, in the, uh, you know, Lake Wisconsin bed, uh, which is flatland, a lot of the willow is, is very marshy uh, shrub willow. Um, they're going to be in there if there's deer in there. They're going to traverse through it otherwise. So it's a component. Um, deer don't usually hang out in there a lot. And so it would probably have less importance to them than other areas, but uh, they definitely would use them. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Paula. Uh, she was wondering what kind of dens do they have to stay warm in, in the bitter cold of Wisconsin? They have no dens. They have fur. And let me tell you, it's amazing. I had a, a coyote trapper caught a wolf on one of the cranberry bogs. And I got the call. It was in the middle of January. It was, it was below zero. I got out there at three o'clock in the afternoon. Here's this wolf in the coyote trap. So I had to sedate it. So now you're worried about, okay, it's very cold. I have the opposite problem is when it's 85 degrees. Out. So the animal went down and uh, I took it out of the trap. And I reached in to grab it. I actually have a picture of me carrying it, but I grab it around the nape and grab it around the rump and you can just literally pick them up. And, uh, and I had to take off my gloves to do that, which I did not want to do because it was below zero. And my fingertips were in the skin, you know, through the fur and those fingertips were boiling hot and my hands were freezing cold and what a sensation it was. So it's like, 
Wolves are northern adapted animals. They go all the way up to within 500 miles of the North Pole. They do not go down through the subtropics. They can't penetrate that. There are northern adapted animals. You can see in this picture here, um, these are wolves. I just took this picture two days ago at sunset. There's five wolves walking down a, a, a forest trail. Um, they love winter. Cold is great. And so they don't need dens. And the only time they use a structure is for their pups for a brief period when those little guys are small. Six weeks. That's it. Thank you. Wow. Um, Bob Fisher was wondering if the DNA signature in the central forest population was distinct from the northern forest, the upper peninsula, or even the Minnesota wolves. And the answer is no. We've had limited DNA work done in the central forest, but we have had some. Um, there are uh, some suggestions that there's some very slight unique signatures, but nothing substantial. Um, and then also, uh, we really look at the population as being a meta population, the upper Great Lakes. So, and, and we certainly, you can see from my maps on dispersers that they are connected. And so genes are being transferred. So there's nothing unique about the central forest wolves that makes them different from Northern Wisconsin or Minnesota. Thank you. Um. Mudcat <laughs> wanted to know if the population has topped out in the central region, whether or not they'd be expected to branch out towards the Mississippi, towards counties like Buffalo, um, La Crosse, things like that. They're probably there already um, in the form of dispersers. Um, and so it, it, nothing would fool me or surprise me if somebody said, well, you know, I have wolf tracks in the Miss, upper Mississippi, you know, uh, refuge or something like that. What would surprise me is do you have a pack? You know, there's a picture of a pack of wolves, um, tracks in the snow. Um, the chance that they're gonna be a reproductive pack is, is lower um, than dispersing animals. So, you know, in the realm of dispersing animals, they're probably in almost every county in the state, um, uh, you know, on occasion. Uh, with regards to colonizing where they're actually establishing a territory and reproducing, that's a different thing. And I, I would love to see that. Um, but I also would caution you that most of these places have a lot of farms and a lot of livestock, and it's going to be the effect of marginal habitat. We really don't want wolves there because people are, you know, have a lot of angst against wolves to begin with. They don't need, wolves do not need that. Um, and so where they're found today in Wisconsin is pretty much what we can provide them in terms of remote habitat. Thank you. Uh, Tanner wanted to know for people who like hiking, hunting, and other activities, what something, what are some things they can and should consider to stay safe from a potential wolf-human contact? Um, first off, if you've got a dog, you leash it and keep it leashed. Um, they're territorial; they will attack dogs, and um, no questions about it. Um, if you have a free-ranging dog, you know, like this picture here, if you were to run your dog up and down that road because you're in a wild spot, nobody's going to care. It's not a city park. Um, it is a city park. It's called a wolf city. Um, and, uh, and those wolves, if they see that, that dog out there, they can become very aggressive. Um, and so if you are out there walking with a dog, keep it leashed, keep it by your side. Um, and some wolves have personalities. Some are more aggressive than others. And I've had instances where citizens have reported some pretty aggressive behaviors um, with people with dogs on leash um, and, uh, and nobody's gotten hurt, but um, you, you probably are gonna change your underwear at the end of that day. But in any event, um, uh, you have to be consider the fact that in wild areas, it's not just wolves either, I mean, black bears um, and things. Bob, we have bobcats out here. Um, any of those things can take a dog. Um, and so you, you need to just be cognizant of your surroundings and act accordingly. That, that's the only area where I would say you could get into a problem with wolves. Um, exceedingly rarely, you might bump into a rendezvous site in the middle of summer, although in most of Wisconsin, you wouldn't want to be there anyhow because the mosquitoes are so terrible. But um, in any event, um, um, I've had situations where I've had wolves bark at me. And incidentally, wolves don't bark. They're, they're the progenitor of wolves and dogs was a, you know, a prehistoric wolf, but uh, 
Uh, dogs bark for a whole mess of reasons. Wolves don't bark except for one reason. When they're threatened, they bark. And if they bark, it's time to just leave. And you walk away. You don't run. Um, you just leave. And, uh, and so that's the only situation, and it would be exceedingly rare. I, I don't know that I've ever had anybody describe that to me other than myself and my family because we're out hauling to wolves at night and we get too close to the pups and we get barked at. And, uh, and my whole family knows, oh, okay, we, we have to leave. Um, but in any event, uh, those would be the only situations I would think of um, where you'd uh, have to exercise some caution. Thank you. Uh, Patricia asked uh, to her state, she lives in a dense suburb of Buffalo with a section of wooded area in the yard. Uh, recently, they have been seeing a lot of coyotes, uh, even can hear them howling at night. Um, what is the real difference between coyotes and wolves and could wolves ever track into suburbs? Well, I mean, physiologically, wolves and coyotes are different. I mean, coyotes are half the size of wolves and they have a very cosmopolitan diet. Um, and they certainly have higher densities. Um, when they reproduce, they're, they dis, disband in November and they come back together during the breeding season or a pair might make it through the winter. So they're very flexible socially or asocially. Um, coyotes can live and do live in any kind of suburban area and even in urban areas. Um, and uh, um, wolves tend not to but wolves have been known to, you know, get into urban areas um, rarely and temporarily. Um, no issues other than the fact that I think for both the wolf and the people, it's, it's freaky. And so the wolves tend to just avoid those places. You, see, you can never say never that a wolf might, you know, like where I live, um, we have coyotes here. And uh, I've heard wolves howl once and I've seen tracks of a single animal once um, and it was a disperser, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a rural um, subdivision, if you will. But, uh, you know, they're here today, gone tomorrow type thing. I, I wouldn't think there'd be any problem other than the fact that, you know, just be careful. Thank you. Uh, Diane wondered if bear baiting in the central forest region is affecting wolf behavior. Up to this point, the bottom half of the central forest is in a no, no hound zone. And so baiting is not prolific here in the northern half. It's, it's part of the process. We know in northern Wisconsin that it does have impacts. Um, and uh, um, I can't answer the question with regards to central forest because I've really never investigated that nor talked to anybody up in the northern part of the central forest, east of Eau Claire, for instance, um, where that could be an issue. So I can't really answer that question, but if it's gonna happen under current statutes for bear hunting, it would be more the northern half of the central forest than the southern half. Okay. Um, Sarah wanted to know, uh, does the movement or growth of wolf territory mirror the growth of the deer population? Probably not because the expansion of deer numbers um, occurred before wolves even really got a foothold in the state of Wisconsin. Um, to say that it, there is no association would probably be naive as well. But, you know, I'm so doggone old that when I was a kid, there were no deer in the southern part of the state of Wisconsin. It made the newspapers in Waukesha County, where I lived as a child, if there was a deer scene. And, um, and deer rapidly colonized the area. By the time I was out of college, there were deer everywhere down there. I think there's lots of deer down there now. Um, so, but there aren't any wolves down there yet. And I wouldn't ever want to see wolves down there because they would conflict with humans because there's so, so human dominated landscapes in a lot of Wisconsin. You just can't have wolves in some of those places. And she was also wondering if a gray wolf is the same as a timber wolf. Yes, it is. Those are vernacular names or common names for the same creature. And I'm sorry, I did not say that. Um, Canis lupus is the wolf uh, scientifically. And that's what we have in Wisconsin. 
And Canis lupus is either called the gray wolf or the timber wolf. And uh, in the Southwest, it can be the Spanish word for wolf is lobo, and they're called lobos some, in some places in the Southwest. So yeah, that's what they are. They're the same thing. Okay. Um, Michael Bryan was wondering if you have a comment on the proposed wolf hunt. Um, initially, I heard last night that it passed, but then this morning, AP poll said it did not pass. There was a proposal pushed to the Natural Resources Board by the state legislature to institute very quickly a wolf hunt February 1st to February 28th, which is statutorily allowable. Um, my opinion, exceedingly unwise. Um, I made comments to that effect uh, to the NRB, Natural Resources Board, as did 1,400 other people, pro and con, I assume. Um, the wolf uh, harvest um, is going to certainly be seen this next fall unless the federal government loses a lawsuit. Um, so in mid-November, there will be a harvest. The DNR is now tasked then um, because this February initiative was shut down, um, they will be uh, working on um, what are the quotas for the six management regions in the state of Wisconsin for wolf harvest. Um, so the quotas would be established and they're leaning on a 1999 wolf management plan, state plan, which I helped write and makes no mention of harvest at all, because at that time there were less than 250 wolves in the state. So they're gonna to have to be running to get um, that management plan um, upgraded, if you will. Um, I would doubt that even if they don't have that upgraded, um, that that would prevent them from having a harvest. Um, so you'll see some kind of harvest unless the, um, a lawsuit stops it. Uh, now, as, in terms of whether I think there should be a harvest, I do. Um, wolves are getting into areas, marginal areas, where they're causing problems with livestock interests. Uh, and I don't like that because it just, it just increases the animosity towards these animals and they come up with an animosity stamped on their forehead anyhow. Um, and so keeping them in places like this is different than keeping them in farm country. Um, and we really have a responsibility to manage and conserve our natural resources where there's a best fit. And it's not a best fit in places uh, surrounding, like, for instance, Stevens Point, where we have packs of wolves now. Um, that's, that's farm country. And, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of woodlots and things, but there's, you know, which is where they seek cover. But um, this, this is part of the problem with managing wolves. And, uh, um, and so, yes, a harvest might reduce some of the, the, um, the angst, you know, that the public feels towards these guys um, and, and keep them in these kinds of habitats, but keep them out of some of the other stuff. Thank you. Um, Tanner was wondering if you could share the, the slide, or I'm paraphrasing this, um, with your, your full name and, and title. Um, he wanted to make sure he had the correct information. Um, on your full name and uh, title, I guess. What my, my name and title is? My <laughs> name is Dick Thiel, and the last name is spelled T as in Tom, H-I-E-L, and my title is retired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mudcat was wondering if, uh, can wolves be considered advantageous in dealing with um, he called it deer brain disease, but uh, CWD. <laughs> CWD is chronic wasting disease, which is um, it's a prion disease, and it's not living. It's not a living organism. It's just a, a conundrum that's really exasperating a lot of natural resource wildlife management dollars to try and combat, and the spread is just continuing nationwide, actually North American wide. So the question really is, can wolves somehow abate the spread or diminish the uh, role of it as a disease vector in deer? Um, and the answer is we don't know. And the reason why we don't know is we don't have wolves where there are uh, afflicted deer. Now we're getting close. And the reason for that is as CWD is coming closer to the central forest, whether the DNR would initiate such a study is another question. But we're also getting close in Yellowstone National Park, which has huge ungulate populations. Um, and, uh, and they are 
initiating some studies right now to, to basically explore those questions. What I think, based on what I know, which can be dangerous, uh, is that don't expect wolves to be the panacea, the answer to CWD. And the reason for that is that CWD is environmentally um, stable. That, uh, that protein can stay in the ground uh, at extreme temperatures, rain, drought, doesn't matter. And if it's, if it's picked up by a deer two years later, it's, it's infective. Uh, so if a wolf kills a deer, it kills the deer, probably allays that deer from spreading it further, but it's still endemic in the soils and in the vegetation uh, on, on which that deer population exists. And deer are the vector spreading it because deer move locally. And as they creep in far, as this disease is creeping farther north from, you know, west of Madison initially, um, it's just happening. And I don't think that wolves are going to have a huge impact on it. I could be wrong. And I really am looking forward to some of the neat stuff that maybe Yellowstone will provide us because they've got elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, and they've got a, a small population of moose as well, all of which are highly susceptible to CWD. So the answer to that question is stay tuned and look to Yellowstone for some answers. Thank you. Um, Tanner says that he lives in La Crosse uh, and the hiking is very popular, popular in this area. And what should someone do if they encounter a disperser? Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if he means reporting wise or just as a personal yeah you can report it um, DNR has a, um, a portal on their web pages for reporting rare mammals um, and so I don't know the exact site but you can do that and that's fine so reporting yes in terms of personal safety um, I don't think you'd have an issue but like with any animal um, you want to stop certainly look at it because that's a that'd be a heck of a sight um and then if, if the the animal typically what's going to happen is the animal is going to slide past you it's going to go around you or a reverse course um and then consider yourself fortunate to have such a an experience um but you know i've told people before that uh, if you feel scared about a wolf climb a tree that's one thing wolves can't do. They haven't figured out chainsawing a tree down. Um, but in any event, um, I can tell you how many times, I mean, I, you know, when I go out wolf howling, I never carry a firearm. I rarely have a jackknife with me and I don't carry flashlights because to carry a flashlight in the woods just advertises your presence, the wolves see it. Um, and so um, I've had wolves in the dark walk up to me, um, had those experiences in daylight and uh, I've never felt threatened by wolves but on the other hand I also know their behavior probably more than most people do and I can sense when there's something that might be threatening whereas I can see where an animal like that could be misinterpreted behavior but um, the chance that you'd be threatened is, is very very low so um, just just regale in the experience I think that I mean, the, every time I've had that happen, it's just like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, I have a couple of thanks for your presentation. And Patricia said that she'd be um, whoop, just filmed up. Would love to see any follow up topics on any other wolf topic. Um, Bob Fisher asked if uh, hunting wolves is just for the sport of shooting. And what do you do with a wolf after you kill it? Okay, so um, with regards to harvesting wolves, you know, I'm a wildlife biologist. We harvest a lot of stuff. And some species are harvested for food. Some of them are harvested uh, for their fur, and this would be the case of wolves. Um, you could either mount, you know, have it mounted taxidermically and put it on the floor or on a wall, um, preserve the skull as a keep, as, uh, as, you know, a keepsake. Um, you can sell the fur. Uh, so there's a number of outlets that is actually allowable. Um, and so it falls in the realm of what we call recreational uh, harvesting. Uh, you, you could eat the meat. Most people would, would not. 
Um, but in any event, um, those would be the sportsman's angle towards you know why a person might harvest them. Uh, on the other hand, some of this is motivated by hatred towards wolves. There's a minority of, of um, citizens in Wisconsin that just hate them and they want them out of here. And so there is that motivation as well, which is what's been fueling really this, this ugliness within our state legislature towards wolves is, is fueled by their constituents just hate wolves. Um, and so us citizens have to guard against that infiltrating inside the, uh, the hunting community. I'm, I'm a former hunter. Um, and I just don't see anything wrong with it. I personally would never harvest a wolf, but, um, you know, I have wolf skulls here. Um, you know, so, um, I, you know, I can value some of those things and, um, we just have to learn to respect people for some of their differences. And as long as it's reasonable, um, it, it can, it should be tolerated. And of course, keep in mind that any harvesting of wolves, like any other species has to be done. Uh, with science and it's got to be balanced, you know, so that we're not over harvesting and causing populations to, to become extinct or something like that. And, you know, I would, I would almost bet you that they're going to want to de decrease the size of the wolf population next fall. And I'm not actually against that. Um, but, you know, in habitats like what you see here, um, we should pretty much leave them alone. Um, and uh, in Wisconsin, I'm going to guess, and keep in mind, I'm um, quasi-scientific, you know, we'll leave the scientists figure this out, but in, in the northern forest region and central forest region between the two of them, I feel that in these really good optimal habitats, um, a wolf population of around 600 wolves would not be inordinate to, to try and maintain. Like to go below it, to me, seems a little bit crazy. I mean, and, and again, I, I will wait for the science because that's what people get paid for. Um, but knowing what I do know, um, I'm going to guess somewhere around 600, you know, that it'd be kind of interesting to see what they come up with. So anyway. Dick, this is Sarah. I'm going to have to um, wrap up here because we'll get cut off in a few minutes automatically. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us and uh, thank everyone for attending. I want to invite all of you to visit us at www.mississippivalleyconservancy.org where you can sign up at the very bottom of the page to receive our e-newsletter and stay informed of local conservation news and more events like this and other activities that we offer throughout the year. Mississippi Valley Conservancy is a nonprofit organization and it's thanks to member support that we permanently protect more than 21,000 acres in Wisconsin's driftless area. In just the past week, another 222 acres was added to the total amount of land we protect. So I also encourage you to like Mississippi Valley Conservancy on Facebook, where we also share our news and activities. And I thank you all. Uh, we hope to see you on the trails again soon. And please join us for our next Linked to the Land event. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thanks. And I'll just jump in. I guess Kara asked a question quick. I don't know if I'll have enough time to answer this, but we have not seen uh, any wolves on Mississippi Valley Conservancy protected lands as of yet. Hopefully we don't get off. Cut off. <laughs> Thanks. I'm going to sign off. Sign us all out now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.